uh, where we write about cars. Uh, I'm Rob Edwards, and I'm a manager of creative technology at Team One Advertising, um, also a car nerd. Yeah, and uh, the what we're going to talk about today is uh, car hacking. Title, you know, will hackers and makers save car culture? I'm actually I'm not 100% on the title, because I think car culture is actually okay, but there's a reason why we're, we're framing it like this, because... Oh, wait, this is us. Never mind, I should have gone to this sooner. So yeah, there we are again. And by the way, if you want to get a hold of us, Robert C. Edwards, C. Edwards uh, and Jason Torchinski, if you want to Twitter or read us, whatever you want to do. So, how we, how we got here. It started with... The, there was actually... This is one of many articles, but the New York Times ran an article about the end of car culture. Um... And this is actually, you know, actually Cracked even just did an article about the dying of car culture, and people have been talking about it a lot. There's this idea that millennials don't give a shit about cars, and nobody's buying cars anymore. Uh, anything you want to add about? I mean, it seems like the, the, each of the articles kind of, point, kind of points to the point that uh, kids just don't feel that they need to connect using cars. They have the internet and social media, and they're able to essentially not they don't have the fear of missing out as much right. anymore. Even that, that term didn't exist beforehand. It's that they can connect and feel as if they're connected without necessarily using a car to leave their parents' house. And, and they also don't hate their, their parents. parents as much as apparently we all did. Because <laughs> <laughs> the impetus to get the hell out of the house when you were 16, I saved, I got my first, my old Beetle, when I was 15, saving up 600 bucks solely for the purpose of getting the fuck out of the house. And I hear kids get along better with their parents now, and that's not as big an issue. Yeah. And with social media, everybody thinks they just have fun on their phones and they don't talk to each other. And, and I think that you know some of this is true in terms of the, the things that kids are excited about with cars, and that they're not necessarily being made more accessible as well to, to kids. So maybe they're not buying as many new cars, but people are still buying cars and driving them as platforms as well. Yeah. Now, let's think about what's going on here, because I, I don't really think this is entirely true. I think there's always been a subset of people who are interested in cars and will deal with cars and love to play around with cars, and I don't think that's actually changing necessarily. Now, the average kid's ability to get a hold of their friends on Twitter or Facebook or whatever the hell, it you know, there's always going to be a hard limit to that, because on some level, kids still want to be in physical contact with each other. They want to see each other and dry hump one another and do all those things that, you know, kids like to do. So there's always going to be an urge to have your own private space and your own means to actually get in physical proximity to other people. So let's, we're going to go back and look at actually how car hacking itself started. And car hacking has been around ever since people started buying cars. You could have Model Ts. There was a ton of companies making alternate bodies for Model Ts before there were... You, you, on a Model T to fill up the gas tank, you used to have to lift the seat and get to it. There were companies making aftermarket different gas filler systems. I mean, it's been around forever. But it really probably kind of got codified and aligned with youth culture in the hot rod era, probably in the just after World War II, late, late 40s, early 50s, somewhere in there. And those guys were taking basically pre-war cars and putting bigger engines in them. Actually, you know, cars were common and getting cheap enough that you actually could start to really mess around with and have fun with a car. And then manufacturers started looking at what those hot rodders were doing with modifying cars. Multiple carbs, bigger engines, and smaller bodies. And like the muscle car, for example, as a concept, came around completely as a result by watching what these old hot rodders and hackers were doing. They saw you put a bigger engine into a smaller car, it'll go faster. And you know they started actually producing cars like you know like the '66 Nova we have here, um, you know even things you know all of all of the big ones. Like, yeah, I think uh, that it's interesting. It's the trickle down effect of the innovators on the forefront playing with the technology, messing with it, hacking it away at it, and then it slowly trickles down and back into the loop of manufacturing. They say, oh look, what they're interested in now, let's try and bring that into the fold ourselves and replicate it. And then usually when they hit, well especially in these times, I think they were able to iterate a lot faster and they were doing this more quickly as time has gone on, yeah. the manufacturers are, are a little bit slower to respond in general. Well, so there was less issues about safety and things like that. Nobody really <laughs> cared how bad you got killed in these cars back in the day. <laughs> nobody was thinking about Yeah, it. nobody thought about it. So, you know, you could put a big engine in a smaller body and have an all-metal dash that you would just hose off after the wreck and, <laughs> and sell to someone else. And then, you know, recently the idea of what it meant to be a you know someone who was interested in cars or car culture has kind of gotten stereotyped by the Fast and Furious kind of movies and movement where people are shifting through 
16 speed cars <laughs> constantly and all kinds of ridiculous crap, but... It really exposed also this culture to a group of people to the mainstream that hadn't been exposed to a lot of this stuff before. Obviously there are car clubs, truck clubs, people doing sure. this, there are car shows and things like that, but mass media hadn't necessarily grabbed onto it, at least not at this level, and you know, gotten it worldwide, worldwide coverage. Yeah. And these people are doing basically the same thing those 50s era hot walk rodders were doing as well. They're just making the cars that they had faster and more interesting and more fun. So there's even all of the anti-racer movement, which is kind of a horrible term, um, uh, hostility you see is really misplaced because they're, they're doing the exact same things, they're just doing it different ways. Instead yeah, of putting on multiple cars, forms, yeah, yeah, they're flashing the you know engine computer and changing the fuel injection mapping and using you know, laptops to hook it up, change right. the fuel curve, all that kind of thing, the, those kinds of things. Yeah, and it's not necessarily any more ridiculous looking than what people were doing in the 50s. Rats, rats, rats. Rats. Yeah, yeah, come on, it's all, cars. it's supposed to be a little bit. So. Of course, manufacturers are seeing what's going on there and they're starting to integrate. Uh, these same kind of innovations into the production cars, just like before, where the muscle cars came out of uh, the early hot rodder movement. A lot of modern performance or street performance cars are taking things from the uh, the more modern uh, you know, like performance car. Yeah, and the technological movement too, and the, the yeah. gadgets and telemetry data and kind of the uh, infotainment centers and trying to hack on that style of platform rather than the engine as platform. It's the it's car as technology. As platform. And that kind of brings us now, like there's this perception right now that cars have become too complex. Part of the reason a lot of these articles state why they're not people interested in cars as much is they feel like they've become too complicated, too many computers, and they're getting too complex for people to really hack and work with. But the thing is, that's just not true. The tools have gotten better as well. So we have access to so many more things to really mess with cars now that we never had access to before. Uh, you know, and there's like small computers like Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, all of these things that you can integrate with cars, ways you get in through the OBD2 port. Well, we're we're going to cover all this. And we have all, you know, our iPhones and, and smartphones yeah. and laptops to access all that data now, too. We obviously all have laptops and have smartphones, and now we have the, the means for hacking that technology. Right. But. But. What is that? Why do we have a Oh, right. Yeah, because we were talking, yeah. So this, again, fits with the reason everybody thinking everybody's much more interested in, um, you know, Tech, gadgets, gadgets, gadgets from smart phones, yeah. um, social media, yeah. ham radios, and whatever the kids are playing with, <laughs> Snapchat, Snapchats, and the grinders, and the, uh, you know, so, okay, so, but the thing is, all this technology gives us the ability to connect, you know, with these, you know, what they're saying, without transporting bodies, but again, like we said before, it doesn't matter how much you're going to connect on your phone, there's still going to be a visceral pleasure of not only being a person, but just moving. Driving fast is actually its own pleasure. Driving in an inspirited way, driving in a curvy road, all of these things are not going to change, and there's no way in hell you're going to get that on your smartphone. There's always a place for cars. And those are human physical experiences. It's, these are all abstractions yeah. you know, of, of some interaction with people, whether it's photographic or you know, video, and, and the thing with cars or with something physical is it's real, it's visceral, you, you know you own it, you know, that type of thing. It's a, it's a very different kind of feeling. Right. So, and then, now a lot of the reason why they think that, well, why millennials allegedly aren't buying new cars is because everybody's broke. Of course they're not buying new cars, nobody has any money, it's hard to get jobs, but there's, and nobody's really tracking, are they even tracking how many used cars? I mean, it's not mentioned in these articles, and I think that's a big failing point, because yeah. it's, so new cars aren't being sold as often. I mean, I think that there's obviously a value to a used car, and obviously it drops dramatically. I mean, who was buying a new car when they're 22? Right. I mean, some I'm sure you know some people are, and they get them as gifts. But honestly, who, who was your first? Who was first car was a used piece of shit? Yeah, exactly. And that's how it should be because you're gonna wreck it. That's what you do with every first car you have. So I think all these articles they're they're looking at half the data. They're they're looking at new car sales for people in their early 20s, and I don't even think that ever really I happened. think we've extended out the youth in general in terms of adolescence, and it's bleaching out in, into the 20s and such, and it's been a, a, little, a little while to grow yeah. up. Yeah, that, that's definitely true. And all these other factors in here, you know, urban, if you live in a major city like New York or London or, you know, or a lot of San Francisco, yeah. you're probably not going to have a car anyway. Unless, you know, L.A., of course, is a little different. You probably will. <laughs> um, you know, and all these, you know, local forism and all that stuff. People are still going to want their cars. So, now, the thing is, a lot of these complaints that people have, we, you know, if we just look at what people are interested in cars and what young people allegedly are interested in now with hacking and 
you know, the, this kind of the mobile tech that everybody's interested in, there's a huge, a huge resurgence happening in what people are doing with cars right now. There's a new kind of hot rodding going on, a new kind of hacking, and it's involving a lot of very high tech stuff and but accessible but cheap high tech stuff that anybody can get access to and people are doing all kinds of fascinating things with them so for example I mean, these are just some general hacks people yeah so just in the general world of hacking the concept of, of finally people are starting to embrace technology they're making it more accessible by using platforms like the Arduino in order to hack at devices at physical things so it's this from the digital to the physical world has become cheaper and the tools have been become cheaper. So I mean, people are hacking, doing the SMS to open your door, and, and you can see it. I mean, it's a servo connected to a latch, and then obviously Lock, Lock to Tron, or uh, the one company that did a, a Bluetooth deadbolt, and that concept, yeah. this is you know a little bit fast after this, and it's more of a consumer device, but it, you see the trickle down from innovators down to a consumer device, the same capacity as the car stuff. Right. And of course, maker culture is huge. And it also, it, this is very true. The idea that you can start making interesting physical things, things that interact with the physical world, has become a lot more popular thanks to you know magazines like Make and the whole DIY movement. And what's better for the physical world than a car? That's super physical. It can kill you. It does all kinds of great things. You can carry. It's even mildly useful. Well, I love the concept too. You mentioned yesterday. It's like the, it's not only the thing that's an object and a location. Right. Yeah. Well, we don't treat cars the same as other things. Like my 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 wife had an old Buick, an old '78 Buick, and it finally died. And when they took it away, she actually cried. She never cried when we got rid of our dishwasher or our refrigerator because nobody gives a shit. But a car is different. You have a much stronger emotional bond with a car than you do with almost any other piece of machinery you're likely to own. It's very different. And it's very individual, too. It's, it's, you know, you may have a house that you share with roommates or maybe with a significant other or maybe an apartment that you own yourself, but that's probably not as likely as having a car you own yourself. Yeah. You don't share between people, and it, it becomes this base of operations, and I feel like when you don't have a, a vehicle to work from or to have that, you, you kind of lose this space and identi you know, like identity. Identity is huge. It's, it's almost closer to fashion or clothing, the way people yeah. identify themselves as being part of a particular culture. A car is a big part of that, too. There's cars that you may feel embarrassed to drive in because it's so not you. And, and you know, as a you know, as a motor journalist, I often get press cars, and there's ones occasionally I'm driving around. I don't really want anybody seeing me in them because it's just not who I am, and I don't have to explain it's a press car. <laughs> but I mean, th there's very few other things like that. If I'm holding a different kind of phone, I don't really care well, about so so if someone sees me with a Galaxy or whatever. The hell. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so, oh yeah, this I guess I should have gone to this slide showing all the cool things people are doing: Robo hands, Elizabethan collars. So let's uh, look at quickly some, some interesting car hacks we've seen. Starting, we'll go back a little bit, a few years. So you want to talk about the Connected RX-8? Yeah, so the Connected RX-8 uses a bunch of off-the-shelf uh, open source devices in order to get the telemetry, in this case, data off of, out, of the, uh, out of the car and into a database. Um, there's a computer sitting um, on basically a little Linux box, something similar to a Raspberry Pi. And it's doing data logging and pulling in information from a OBD2 connector, the data port that's been in all cars since 1996. Um, and so it pulls that in, then he has a, a web server running, and he has uh, his iPod Touch, actually, in this case, this was 2009. Um, so he was using that to, there you can see the battery and the RPM and that type of thing. And then he was logging, so then he had a website that showed him charts of information and kind of gave him the data that was available inside the car that wasn't really able to get, you couldn't get it out very easily. Um, and this was, you know, OBD2 connector. He put a very uh, crazy set of equipment together himself to make this system. Um, and this was, you know, kind of the foregrounds of, of hacking on, on this system with telemetry. And, um, and at this point, this was still fairly expensive and difficult, and all of this is getting much, much easier now. It's still not super easy to get this data out of the OBD2 port. But you can, and there, we'll talk later about Ford's got uh, OpenXC. So Ford is actually making an open source platform just for the purpose of getting this data out of your car. And it's designed for not just car applications. If you want to do, let's say you have like a big blank canvas and an X and Y motors with a paintbrush and you want it to paint the path your car has been taking, it can read the GPS data, you can send that to a little Arduino or whatever on your little canvas motors and actually paint based on the car's data. Or you know, draw something based on the, you know, the RPM output based on the tachometer readings. All this stuff is now getting easier and more possible. 
and it's even in some unexpected ways, like progressive, that little thing they want you to plug into your car. I mean, what is it called? Uh, snapshot. Snapshot. It basically is an OBD2 reader. It plugs into the OBD2 port, and it sends data back to progressive. We were just looking to see if anyone's hacked it yet. People are already starting to talk about it. I don't know if anyone's actually done it yet, but that's reading OBD2, OBD2 data and sending it over probably uh, 3G or some other type of cell network. Mm -hmm. That's right there. There's so much you could do with that little box if you can get a hold of one and start to tear it apart. <laughs> people will, absolutely. Uh, yeah, people have made cars that you can drive with an iPhone. So these are the things, like these early cars, you know, they're, where they're not drive by wire, they have physical servo motors and things to actually accelerate steer, and they made an interface where the iPhone could control it. Modern cars are starting to be all electrical signals instead of physical, like, hydraulics and things like that. So, in theory, we're getting to a point where a car can be driven and controlled without, you know, purely electronically based on the hardware already in the car. You don't have to add anything. And that's interesting, too, in this, that while people like, um, you know, the guys on Mythbusters uh, are able to make a remote control car and they can do it with big radios and, and have experience and all that knowledge, this is something that can be done by people as a DIY project, not somebody that's in the professional industry of building and fabricating these types of devices. Now, I would argue that definitely Adam Savage and uh, Jamie are, are absolutely hackers and makers themselves, but they have a ton of experience and have specifically done this yeah. type of work for their life. It's but, their career. Yeah, and this is, this is someone that does this in their hobby, uh, as a hobby, in their spare time and just kind of reaches out and just goes, goes for gold and, and this is what they come up with. There's a lot of potential for trouble with that too. I mean, a remote control car is something you can really make a lot of trouble with. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, okay, when the iPads first came out, because this article is a few years old now, um, people were putting those into cars almost immediately. Uh, and this is this guy was as one of the most one of the earliest and most thought out kind of implementations of it. And commercial is this the commercialized one in the Sunman? So I think yeah. they were doing installs as well. So I mean, if we think about the CarPlay announcement in this past week, and that you know finally we're going to have the type of capability from Apple in the car, they've been doing it since the iPad was out. 2010 is when this article yeah. came out. So and when we're talking about this too, with the kind of infotainment systems, going back to car computers have been being played around with since the early 2000s, and that. People would just put small form factor like the Mac Mini or a Mini ITX board yeah. into the car, or ATX board into the car because it fit in the double DIN unit yeah. and could be powered via 12 volt power, which is already there on the car. And now, like a Raspberry Pi, like a $35 computer gets you video output. A lot of cars now come with video input for those screens, especially minivans and things where you want to keep your kids entertained. So, if you want a car that can have like web browser access, you're, it's literally a cable plug and like 40 bucks away from happening. I mean, it's gotten so easy to do some of this basic stuff now. And, you know, there's no, with a little bit of cutting away some plastic, you can integrate like a little monitor and a little Raspberry Pi in there and have an in-car computer extremely easily. And actually, an iPad mini is almost the exact double DIN size. So the double DIN, that's a, just the name for this standard the tall radio mount two system. It's like two, it's basically like two standard radios. Yeah. But an iPad mini will almost exactly fit, and I believe people are making actually commercial yeah, bezels, uh, bezels to snap yeah, in. to snap in like a little mini now. Uh, someone made a car starter with Siri. Do you know more about this one? Well, that specific, I think they probably use Siri proxy in order to run custom commands based on their, their voice command specifically, yeah. but I mean, very interesting. Just trying to, as it started, starts to get into uh, further in time, you know, they're getting more sophisticated, and, you, and now it's an iPhone instead of an iPod Touch. That means it has internet access, it has Siri specifically, and you could really do not just remote car ignition with the Siri, you, you could control a lot of the stuff via yeah. voice command. I mean, the nice thing is, so many cars now are coming with like, uh, you know, if you've got a car with like a remote that lets you start it, open the doors, open the trunk, that means there is a little wireless receiver in the car, and there's motors and solenoids for like everything that it can open, which means you can send those signals via other means than the little key fob. So cars are basically becoming like raw platforms to do so much more stuff than they ever could. Like if you were to do this on like a vintage car from the 60s, you'd have to install solenoids and motors and a receiver and all that stuff to make it actually do this stuff. Cars are coming from the factory now pre-outfitted with so much hardware in them yeah. that it's really, really amazing what you can do. So it's just a matter of just changing how that data gets to the car, because the car is already halfway to being a robot as it is.